This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So if we think about decision making and the benchmarks for how to make a rational decision, um, there's one feature, a norm, let's say, that underpins a variety of methods. So if it's rational choice and you're maximizing expected utility, or there's three uh, among many uh, methods for classification, or even dynamic programming, and I'll mention why I added that in a minute. The, the central mathematical notion behind these is uh, mathematical, mathematical expectation, and the operation is to integrate weighted information, right, broadly speaking. So there's differences between these methods, and in each are designed for different tasks, but they have this in common. And one of the norms that's regulative of operations of this kind is this total evidence norm. You're not, to be rational, should, you shouldn't uh, ignore freely available, clean, uh, relevant information. So I'm not going to hedge on things such as if you're trying to fit a linear regression, you had some, some stray data points that were rational to, to uh, ignore to fit, to fit your model. I'm talking about data that uh, is relevant to you to your decision-making process. And uh, all of these, pro uh, these benchmarks for rationality have this norm. I mentioned dynamic programming because the father of this, Richard Bellman, late, late in his career wrote, uh, he was sort of surveying the application of, of uh, decision theory. It's actually in an introduction to an AI textbook. And he was saying, look, in most situations, we might as well throw away our information and toss a coin. We just, there's so many things that go wrong. The dimensionality increases too high, uh, we screw it up, uh, and so on. So I'd like to say, I think between these two extremes, so if you think of the gods are up, up, uh, up here where this is what you should do, and I don't know, down here throwing away information, uh, well, yeah, uh, some folks maybe not too fond of looking at evidence. Um, we have bounded rationality, or at least I think is a common understanding of bounded rationality, which is we try to make decisions uh, given limited cognitive constraints, limited time, limited resources, and what we're trying to do is approximate these ideals. And so it also lends itself to a nice clean distinction. So you might think this is where the norms for correct decision making, correct classification, reside and it's the psychologists that are uh, interested in studying bounded rationality, maybe operations researchers. This was how, what S Herbert Simon had in mind. He was thinking of bounded rationality when he coined the term as a descriptive phrase. You know, let's see how people actually call it satisficing. The methods, the routines that they come up with, they're not maximizing expected utility, but they're doing something else in approximating these ideal solutions. I think this is a common understanding of bounded rationality. It's the one, at least, that I had uh, until I saw this. So let me explain what's going on here. Uh, these, you can already I'll give you sort of a hint of where we're going. This crossover is weird, <laughs> OK? There are two things that are going on in two different tasks in the x-axis. These are different models of decision making. I'll describe them in a bit. So we have fitting the data here, and on the y-axis is percentage correct accuracy. So the tasks that I'm going to be talking about are, are classification tasks. You've got two objects, and the decision, you don't know which, uh, which to pick, which category to is the correct category. There's an objective scoring of correctness here. You have some information on which to infer which is the correct of two categories. And then this is the percentage accuracy correct on a number of data sets, it's ranging from 55 to, I think, up here, multiple regression, as you would expect, at least when it's fitting, uh, scored uh, 20, uh, sorry, 78, I believe, percent. The thing that's surprising is that when you're fitting data, uh, a classical model of multiple regression performs best. And these two heuristics, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, don't perform very well. This is another heuristic that uh, uh, we're going to ignore for the, for the time being. But the interesting thing is you get this crossover effect. And this is why I got interested in this topic. So to, to kind of motivate the difference between fitting and prediction, 
the stock market goes down, the market closes, the financial, you turn on the TV and they say, ah, well, there was this crisis in the Middle East and uh, a train derailed in Iowa and uh, there was a, a crop failure in Egypt. That's why the market nudged down in two percentage points today. And people will talk on and on about this. They're doing something akin in my informal description. Uh, so I took my lesson from the last lecture. Uh, they're fitting, right? It's, they have data, they've come up with a theory, a just-so story, in this case a mathematical uh, fit for the data they've observed. But it's a whole nother story to before the markets close the next day, you get the news reports, uh, their crop failings, the uh, other thing, the events that happen, and then you feel confident to predict what the market will do. So prediction is the thing that we're interested in, or at least the thing I'm interested in. I have information and I don't have the luxury to fit it, I want to make inferences about things that I'm uncertain about. So, well, what happens here when you do out of sample prediction, and this was done on 20 studies, uh, you get this crossover effect, multiple regression, and this is representative of the benchmark examples that I showed you before, performs less well than tallying. What's tallying? Tallying is like multiple regression, but you ignore the weights. You really draw a column, this is so many uh, cues in favor of picking A, let's say, and this is a list of picking B. So you're integrating information, but you're ignoring weights. And then the one that does the best is something called take the best, where you're using just a single piece of information and you're ignoring otherwise relevant information. So if you want a, a slogan, you take the best and you ignore the rest. So I saw this and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Why, why does this occur? Because if this is a case where you get objectively better outcomes as a philosopher, as a normative theorist, I want to know when that happens because that would be the correct, I want to be able to predict, or sorry, to give prescriptive advice to people say, look, if you can identify these situations, you're in those situations, that's the better strategy. So that's my uh, interest in this problem. And we've, I want to report on a couple of results that are making progress on getting that story worked out. And um, so that's what the talk's going to be about. But before I do that, I, I want to also just explain a little bit about what these heuristics are. Because um, uh, there's two traditions that study heuristics. One's uh, Daniel Kahneman and Tversky, and you might think if you're steeped in this tradition that heuristics are vague, they're not very well worked out, and in some cases, or maybe in 30, 40 years ago, that was the case, but we're actually going to be comparing the performance of uh, models that go by this name to standard benchmarks. So let me give you a flavor of what each of these things does. So the first is due to Robin Dawes, this is the tallying, so I, I gave the gloss, this is linear regression ignoring the weights. And there's three components to a heuristic, at least in the Gigerenzer school of how to, how to uh, give algorithmic descriptions of these decision processes. You have a search rule in case of tallying. Well, you have a set of cues. Uh, we'll make it simple, make it uh, all n of them. And you look at them in random order. So you sample each of the cues. And the stopping rules when you run out of the list, however many you're, you're uh, going to use for your decision. And then the decision rule is to predict, so again, you have a, you're trying to make an inference of an unknown uh, categorization task. I'm going to put uh, between A and B, and I need to know whether or not to pick category A or category B. The decision rule is to predict that the alternative, A or B, with the higher number of positive Q values, uh, has the higher criterion value. Right? That's this heuristic. It's a, what's the bias of it? It's ignoring weights. Okay? So that was the second best one in prediction that we saw. Take the best uh, it works like this. So basically, instead of looking at the individual cues randomly, you know their validity. Now, for logicians, what this means is all this, this is just a term in psychology that says, I look at the cue, what's the, pro the cue says A. What's the probability that A is the right choice, right? So that score, that conditional probability, if you like, uh, modulo some, some details that I, I may get to in a little bit. The basic idea is that's what validity is, right? How, how, what's the proportion of correct answers given this, what the cue says? 
So you have a ranking of the individual Q by their validity, strongest to weakest. The idea for the, is you look at the strongest rule. If it discriminates between A and B, you, say what that, you pick what that Q tells you and you ignore the rest. That's what you go with. If they don't discriminate, you just keep going down the list until you find one that does. So the first one that tells you which, uh, that the cues you're looking at will discriminate, you take that one and you ignore the rest, and that's the decision rule. Predict that the alternative with the positive Q value, that is the first one that discriminates, uh, has the higher criterion value. And this, the bias, is ignoring information. So this is, the, this is the class, this is one instance of a class of, they're called single Q lexicographic decision rules. And that's the class I'm interested in, okay? So uh, now I can talk about the outline of the talk. So I'm interested in this question of why. Why, what is it that would explain the good performance uh, of these single Q rules? So I'm gonna give you uh, a first result on this. And just as an overview, one of the attributes that seems to matter is how many objects in your training sample you're looking at. So these single Q uh, rules, these that ignore information, they perform very well when you don't have a lot of objects, you don't have a lot of information to, to train on. Uh, so there's an advantage there, and I'll explain a bit uh, how that works. But then there's a puzzle, because there's actually two, there's a little more to that first result. You might think, and I, I, I mentioned it this way to hopefully trigger this idea is like, look, you started off talking about, um, you know, the wrong, if you will, the wrong way to think of bounded rationality is it had something to do with limited resources. And if you're telling me that, you know, limited information has something to do with the performance of these heuristics, that looks like we're in the same soup. There's nothing, you know, if you have more information, you're, you're just re-describing the classical view of bounded rationality. You're describing situations in which you have limited information, these things are performing well, but if you had more time and more resources to have more information, the norms would stand intact, right? So there's part of that puzzle, uh, there's a, to, to motivate this puzzle, that's true in this first result, you have something to do with the, um, that we'll, say, we'll explain in a bit, about the amount of objects that you're gonna be training on, but there's also another component about how the cues are related to one another. So what the correlation structure is between cues. And this is the feature I found interesting because this is a good representative of something Egon Brunswick or others will talk about ecological structure. It's about the structure, the way the world is, the way the information is structured uh, irrespective of the individual. And insofar as we can get an explanation of these uh, these single Q rules in terms of features that are non-psychological, I'm interested in that, okay? But there's a puzzle uh, that was kind of tied the mathematical psych literature up uh, that seemed to foil this line. And that leads to the second result, puzzle solved. Uh, and then in unpacking the results from that, I think there's some interesting things to say about this little model we have for explaining heuristic performance and something that seems totally unrelated, which is this coherence theory of justification, in particular Bayesian models of this. So there's a, a I think there's, well, I don't want to give the talk now, I want to give, give the talk about the talk, I want to give the talk, so. Um, that's the outline, that's the plan, okay? Questions? Okay, so, the decision task and the setup. I alluded to this, but, what we're going to be talking about are first choice paired comparisons. What are these? So you might think that, uh, well, the, the task is to decide which of two alternatives, A and B, uh, has the larger value on some numerical criterion, that would be labeled C, uh, given their values on some n number of Qs that you have access to. So in the canonical example from Gigerenzer, the task may be you draw two cities from random, Atlanta and Boston, and the criterion you're interested in is which has the larger population, and Qs could be binary, it has, an airport, uh, has a major airport, international airport, it doesn't, uh, number of uh, 
uh, size of the transportation system, just trying to think of a continuous queue, and so on. Things that you may know about each of the cities but not know their population, and then from that infer uh, which of the two has the higher population, the criterion value. And this can apply to anything, but, um, but that's what we're going to be doing. Okay? The queues, um, we're going to make one assumption for this uh, uh, that is, holds throughout. And we're going to assume that the queues are um, perfectly discriminatory. This is a simplifying assumption. And we can return and talk about the, um, how expensive this is to make. But our queues are going to be continuous. But in the end, since all the queues discriminate, we're going to be able to work with models in which uh, the variables are indicator functions, so binary that this thing will collapse to. Okay. Okay. So this is what we were looking at before, and there's a couple of things that uh, we want to um, we can pull out from this. The first result you might think of as uh, explaining at least one dimension of this difference between what it is to fit uh, data to a model and to make a prediction. And so how we're going to do the, set up this first result, we're going to think of accuracy as a function, uh, as I mentioned before, of the size of the training sample. So what's going on? We're going to imagine, well, there are n plus 1 inferences that we could make. So suppose there's n plus 1 uh, draws of cities that we're going to compare, if you like. The training sample will be n of those. And then 1 will be uh, the test sample. So the idea is that for the cross-validations, we'll have n plus 1. And then th this will be run n plus 1 time. Each time, each one of these n plus 1 queues will have their chance at being in the test sample. Right? We'll run this repeatedly. So cross-validations repeated n plus 1 times to ensure that this uh, occurs. And then we need to label some uh, results that we can get from this that we're going to plug into our model. One is, so we, we're, we're trying to measure single Q accuracy. So we do this n plus 1 times. We look and we find that, let's say, x star, that's the single Q that has the average highest validity. So we'll just label that v star. And correspondingly, x star star will be the q in second place and the corresponding validity v star star. Uh, we're going to assume that these are distinct. So v star will be strictly greater than v star star. Uh, and the q's are distinct. So both their, their rankings and their, this is just a simplifying assumption, but I thought I would mention it. So that's the one component to this. The other is, uh, is q covariation. So this is this standing in for this ecological, the way Q information's arranged. And basically, it's just, it, it's, um, uh, whoops, we'll have rho here. Uh, we'll look at the probability that the first and second Q are both correct on some randomly drawn trial T, uh, and the difference between that joint and, and if they were independent, right, product of the margins. So that's what we mean by Q covariation. And we're going to explain Q accuracy in terms of these two. So, uh, so this is how this relationship works. It's simple. It's designed to be simple. Um, we're not trying to wow you with, uh, with, with the mathematics. But it turns out that single Q predictive accuracy is measured by this leave one out uh, validation, alpha is a function of the size of the training sample, where basically, when you s this, this is telling you the difference between the first and second Q, right? The interesting that, and, and this is the, uh, so this is a discount factor of how much these two things differ. And then you get a, you can think of this as you get a boost or a benefit, the degree to which they're correlated, or co they're, the covariance. They're, they're covariant, positively co, uh, covariant. The interesting thing that happens with this is that when, well, when the sample's very lo low, there's only two individuals, uh, objects in the training set, all the models don't work very well. But in very low ends, so when you're looking at objects that are 
between 3 and 10, uh, you get a, an ink, well, let me just show you the graph. This would be better to, <laughs> better to explain. So this, dot, this dotted line here is a theoretical prediction for uh, substituting values of n where they're uh, a function of uh, the number of objects in the training set, which we have uh, right here. And the basic idea is that for these single Q heuristics, when there's only two objects in the training set, they all do lousy. But you get a sharper increase in, in, in performance, positive performance, over, this is naive Bayes, this, you can replicate these results with uh, linear regression and, and uh, regression trees and others in this basket of the benchmark models. You get this steeper improvement for these small number of objects in a training size. Uh, so this effect has been observed, but there hadn't been this little closed form uh, equation. So what we have here is this is the theory, and then this is the, here is the data sets that track this. This is, this is um, for take the best. And because we're assuming single Q uh, that they're perfect discrimination, we're going to use the first Q. So that this is a special case of one Q discrimination. And then this is the uh, comparison to naive Bayes. Yeah. Is there any reason why our assuming covariance is so low? No, this, this was in the data sets we were, that we were looking at. Yeah, this, this is based on 19 data sets. So the values that we're picking out of here are from, from the data. Yeah, and then we're plugging those values into the equation to, to yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, Good, so that's our first result. Um, we can come back to talk about that if you like. Uh, but now I want to get to this puzzle. So the, the thing that is kind of cool about this, or the idea, is you know, here's something you could think of as a function of the amount of information you have. So it still has this cognitive resource boundedness flavor to it. But this thing is what gets me interested, is this, this doesn't have to do with uh, uh, the organism, per se. It has to do with the structure of the, the, the core variation or whatever structure that the uh, cues have, say, in the environment. Yeah? So this, this idea has certainly been pursued. Like, wow, maybe, maybe we can explain single cue and these heuristic performance by identifying uh, the ecological profile of information. And if we identify those features, then we're more, we're, you know, we're, we should use this strategy instead of that strategy. That's the, the idea behind this, uh, this approach. And it's certainly not new to me. Um, so uh, Egan Brunswick's uh, uh, towering figure in, in psychology uh, and the Brunswick lens model still used even in this research. But Brunswick was very keen, this is, photo was taken probably the late 40s, early 50s, just to give a time period. Uh, he was asking under what environmental conditions do, or my Brunswickian question, would be under what environmental conditions do single reason uh, uh, cues or rules perform well? So we saw before rho was pretty low. Do you get a boost always by just boosting rho? A well, rho here is the covariation. It's not Pearson's co correlation coefficient. Um, so does varying that matter? Uh, or is there some other structural feature that we can point to? And the puzzle is, as you might have anticipated, is that there's been various answers that have, are in the literature for what kind of correlation structure would be helpful or not to single Q reasoning. And the few that I want to point out is, uh, so under what conditions, environmental conditions, do single reason rules perform well? One answer, Qs are highly intercorrelated. So this fits with the equation we saw before. You boost boost rho and you get a benefit, all things caterus paribus. Uh, in this model, uh, this, was you, this was done with simulation results and it's looking at average pairwise uh, Q correlation, but this is, I should have uh, changed the notation, but this is Pearson's correlation coefficient here. Okay, so that's one answer. But look at these other two answers. One of them, also Hogarth, uh, Qs are independent. That's a good condition for and that means that they're conditionally dependent. Or there's also results 
um, my co-author uh, has one of them. Cues are conditionally independent, meaning that they're unconditionally dependent. So it's not exactly a contradiction, but it seems to really scupper this view that environmental conditions are going to tell you anything. It looks like anything goes. You could stick anything in this position where rho. And in fact, empirical studies confirm this idea. I mean, there's other studies that Gigerenzer and his colleagues have run trying to find, for instance, that high inter-Q correlation, that they can pick it out from their data sets, and they, they couldn't, right? So I saw this, I got interest, yes? I will get to that. Okay. Be, the short answer is, is the Q's conditionally dependent on the value of the criterion. Yeah. But, but I will get, I, yeah. Okay. So, the central idea that uh, I, I, I think unravels this puzzle is something I call focus correlation. Uh, Wayne Mirvold has written on, on this as well. Uh, and the basic quantities that we're going to, this is getting to Michael's question actually, the basic quantities we're going to be looking at is basically the covariance again, but I'm looking at comparing the covariance of the Q's, simpliciter, this was our row before, to the conditional, the covariation conditional on some criterion value. And it's the difference between these quantities, I claim, that you can do some work with. And I want to show you how. So to put this in probability terms, we can exponentiate this, assume that all the random variables are indicator functions, and then you have something that looks like this in you know, probability. So it's the same quantities. This guy here is just you know, the degree to which, conditioning on C, you, the Qs are dependent over the degree of association you see in the Qs simplicitor, right? So that's what I'm gonna call focus correlation focus with respect to some criterion C. These are, uh, yeah, okay. All, all together? Okay. So, uh, this is getting to our second result. And uh, it it's a, looks a little messier than it really is. We just did it in generality. For the case that we're looking at here, you know, we have this, um, uh, um, we're looking, we're, we're treating the variables as binary variables, so the summation is going to be just over one and zero for each of these uh, cases, whatever the value of the Qs are taken. Let me explain the quantities that are being manipulated here and how this helps resolve our puzzle. So here we have our single Q validity, and we're going to sum over the criterion and, and values for the different Qs. We have this ratio where a new term, this is Q predictability. This is just the posterior probability of the criterion being the value C, let's say, so A is bigger than B, rather than B being bigger than A, let's say. Uh, condition are all the Qs in your set. And you're gonna compare that to the focus correlation of the Qs with respect to C. And then you have some weighting, basically this, these terms are going to tell you, uh, they're going to account for the different weights, the different importance that the Qs, uh, the strengths that the Qs have. All that, all the other Q validities, everything cancels out and you get just these uh, uh, marginal probabilities. So the thing that we can manipulate to answer this ecological question and to resolve the puzzles or to confront the puzzle we saw before is that uh, this is our environmental condition. This is what we can vary within the constraints of how, what's associated with what and how does that impact single Q uh, performance, right? So, um, so what this, I think I've said this, but let me just read the slide. The, the res, what this result says is that our single Q accuracy, it'll increase, as you can see, when the ratio of criterion predictability to focus Q correlation increases. And I'll unpack this in a minute, but just to get this across. So let's return to our puzzle, right? And uh, I'm going to invoke um, some graphical models because these encode uh, some intuitions about these independence and conditional independence conditions. So remember these, particularly these two results that seem contradictory. The one was that Q should be dependent 
but conditionally independent given the criteria. That's these conditions. So the Qs are dependent, X1 and X2 are, de are dependent, but condition on C, they're independent. Right? This was the, this is Constantinos and Laura Martignon's, my co-author and, and Laura Martignon's result, uh, relied on this condition. And then we have this other condition, one of the uh, Barcel and Hogarth models, where Qs, these things, they should be independent, but condition on C, they're dependent, so they're not independent. So how do I resolve this thing, this seemingly, well, I think it's puzzling. In fact, when I first saw that, I thought, ha ha, I'm gonna get a negative result, and somebody's gotta be wrong. <laughs> and I had a positive result, and I'm equally happy. I, I'm one of these strange, I like negative results and positive results the same. <laughs> Just, yeah. Results are nice. But. Here's how this works then to explain this. So now we're going to look at focus correlation and, and I'm just unpacking that because that's the thing that we're going to be manipulating. So I'll just trim off these weights on the right hand side and we're going to look at the focus correlation of the denominator. And so that I can talk about that, I'm going to be talking about N, the numerator of focus correlation, and D, the denominator, right? So I just put that up so we can see what's going on. Well, when this, basically we want to look at values of this focus correlation when this is less than one. And as it drives down less than one, this ratio is going to go up and caterus paribus, everything else staying fixed, the uh, Q value will increase, right? Well, look at this, what happens here. If X1 and X2 are conditionally independent, that means that this is 1, right? Uh, but because all these things are positively relevant, we're not going to look at information that's negatively, you know, we're not going to look at cues that are negatively, uh, give us negative information on, on the criteria. It's one of our assumptions to get the thing started. This will be greater than 1. The cues will be positively associated. So this n over d will be less than 1. That's a good condition, all things considered. Well, look what happens in this, uh, this case, where the Qs are independent, but conditionally dependent. Well, here, the denominator is 1. They're independent. Here, they're conditionally dependent, but it's a weird thing in these causal models. And this is unique. This isn't unique here, but this is the unique causal uh, structure for this uh, uh, causal Markov class. This dependence is negative. So this is 1, and this value will be, uh, uh, will be less than 1. So again, this ratio will be less than 1, and that's positive. Uh, this, this ratio will be positive. Notice also uh, an explanation of when Q correlation helps and when it doesn't. It helps when the Q correlation, this is the first result, so outside of these classes, we're just looking at the relationship of probabilities, uh, covariations between uh, Qs and the conditional covariation. When the Q covariation is greater than the conditional covariation, that will be greater than 1 also. So in each of these three cases, we have an explication and, uh, of how the environmental structure can contribute to single Q uh, performance. OK, so one, the last bit of the talk you might think, hmm, is this maybe trivial? Does this hold in all cases? Um, is, have I just dressed up the triviality result that I worried about earlier? Well, there are cases um, in which the conditional association uh, among the Qs is greater than the, co the covariation within the, within the uh, Q set. We can describe cases intuitively. Suppose you go home now and you see that uh, your bedroom clock is blinking uh, 6.05 and you're, let's say you have a clock in the uh, kitchen, it's also blinking 6.05 and another clock, let's say on your computer, also blinking 6.05. On its own, each of these three, it's very unlikely to see these, these cues uh, occur together. 
However, conditional on there being a power cut at five after six, these are highly correlated. These are, you know, these are all, this is all information you would expect to go together. So these two quantities uh, can, and indeed, this is uh, what I'm basically describing is the conditions under which this Bayesian coherence uh, theory works. So we have some results, and there's uh, uh, references at the back of the um, paper and work with, that I did with Richard Shinas uh, in our MIND paper, where basically, um, when you look at cases of focus, if you're comparing evidence sets by their focus correlation, greater focus correlation, that is when this, when n is greater than d, uh, will track greater incremental confirmation of the evidence of the criterion C. And that holds for the whole class of incremental confirmation measures. It's not pinned to a whole class. This is the, the, the incremental confirmation measures that you see. I think there's a Feitelson and Ells paper where they list a uh, a, a, a long set of measures. I think the this new information measure, the, the thing I think you, Jim, had looked at and Christensen, the results start to break down a little bit. So there's an interesting also thing that falls out of this where you get some evidence for distinguishing incremental confirmation from, uh, um, well, that's an aside. <laughs> but you're here, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so we have this result where uh, more focus correlation tracks more incremental confirmation. And the last thing I just wanted to mention, since with MCMP, is that there are impossibility results in the Bayesian literature about these coherence. How does what I just say square with those? Well, it turns out that the impossibility results are in this, basically they assume this independent witness model, which is a conditional independence condition, which you may recall was one of the, the cases where the single Q of models did really well. In fact, they did better than looking at all the information. If you back away from that, and so you're outside of a Markov class, you're just, the probabilities are, are free to, to move. So this, these values aren't constrained by, by independence or conditional independence conditions. This will be something like in this world. So there's, the connection here doesn't really matter, but they're all, the graphs are totally connected. Then you're looking at the ra ratio of how much correlation do you see in the cues or evidence versus the correlation you would see because of C, because of the criterion or the hypothesis. And when you see more of the covariation because of C than C alone, well, then the evidence will give you, uh, if you're comp making comparisons, the, the evidence with a higher degree of focus correlation will track higher incremental confirmation. And in the limit case, which I think is what people were worried about in banning this you know, having it, looking at thinking of these conditional independence conditions as ideal is, you know, the correlations because, well, X1 seen what C says, but X2 doesn't have a clue. All X2 does is just repeat what X1 says. So the coherence there shouldn't tell you anything. And in fact, you can derive without any confirmation measures that indeed uh, uh, the, this, uh, this, this coherence doesn't track uh, confirmation. So this is to say, in short, that the Bayesian impossibility results, they actually live in a very narrow class of models. And the mistake was to think that they were ideal, and you could generalize to all, uh, you know, to all cases, and this is not true. But the interesting thing is that the, one of the classes, and in fact a number of them, uh, when you put independence and conditional independence conditions, they happen to be cases where these single Q re, uh, rules, caterus paribus, uh, perform better. So in sum, uh, conditional independence, uh, it's lousy for these total evidence strategies, and I did the coherence thing as an example, but it's good for single Q, for the reason, that's result two. Uh, because it doesn't work in all of these cases, I'm now starting to think of this as a, an argument for the robustness of the single Q strategies. I don't want to lean too heavily on this, but, but the idea is that, you know, in conditional independent Qs, caterus paribus, this is good. Independent Qs, also good. 
uh, when the, it's, this is deflationary focus correlation, that just means when there's more Q correlation on their own versus Q correlation given the criterion, that's good. But in the one case that's missing, when you have, whoops, when you have inflationary focus correlation, this is bad for single Q, uh, but it's, it's the perfect case for doing coherence reasoning. So the final remarks uh, I want to just suggest, and I'd like to get your reactions to, is that this coherentism and heuristics, they look, they're starting to look to me as co complementary reasoning strategies. And one of the things that's determining their performance is this structure of the information. So it's a, almost a kind of externalist coherentist theory that comes out of this. But um, it suggests to me anyway, more generally, an adaptivist approach to epistemology. So whereas, um, well, Giga Renzer and certainly the theoretical biologists, they they're also have this interest in how well strategies adapt to the environment. They have particular decision models or psychological processes that are constraining their search for models and then looking for structures in the environment that fit. It's a descriptive enterprise. And the things that we were doing here was essentially reversing this. So um, yes, we had an idea of a model we were interested in exploring, but what we wanted to do as philosophers and as a normative program was to try to systematically explore the structural features that we thought from looking at the empirical literatures would influence the behavior of, this, uh, of these Q rules, uh, the, of these strategies, these single Q strategies. And the last point I want to mention is that the, the mathematics we picked were very simple and it was on purpose because we don't just want to find models that explain this. What we would like to, that normatively, what we would like ideally is to have prescriptive advice to, have, to hold. And the quantities that we're manipulating are candidates. They're things that we know people can, whether they do or not, we're going to have to investigate, but they can manipulate. People are pretty good at looking at determining uh, covariation structure. And the kinds of quantities that we're manipulating, covariation versus conditional covariation, they also can do this. Um, so these are in, this is in the realm of the quantities that we're looking at that we could build uh, prescriptive advice to answer the question that I led with, which was hopefully one of these days to be able to say when it's better to reason the fast and frugal way or when it's better to reason the classical Bayesian way. Thank you.